After topping up the 84-gallon fuel tanks, the Spitfire is manhandled into a hangar. In 1940, operational fighters would have been serviced on the airfield, only going into the hangars for major work. A number of skilled tradesmen are needed, even for a daily inspection. They're all RAF servicemen, and at this early stage of the war, probably regulars who'd been trained on biplanes. An airframe rigger tests the wheel brakes, which are operated by compressed air at 200 pounds per square inch. The fabric covered tail control surfaces, the rudder and elevators, which the rigger tests for full, free and correct movement. The ailerons too are checked. It was not unknown for these vital controls to be connected in reverse after major overhaul. The rigger is operating the elevator trim wheel. This secondary flight control moves small trim tabs on the elevator, which enable the pilot to adjust for hands-off flight, compensating for nose or tail heaviness as the power changes. The rudder bar is moved to the limit of its travel and the bias is checked. The Spitfire 1's landing flaps, like the brakes, are operated by compressed air and can only be either fully down or up. The wheels are normally retracted by hydraulic power from an engine-driven pump, but this lever releases an emergency supply of carbon dioxide to the undercarriage. The radio on early Spitfires was tuned mechanically by a cable linkage from this control box. This Spitfire is fitted with the TR-9 HF radio, which was standard throughout the Battle of Britain. Many TR-9s were fitted with Pipsqueak, an automatic timer which switched on the transmitter for 14 seconds in each minute to enable DF stations to track individual aircraft. HF radio was to remain in service until late in 1940, when a VHF set, the TR-1143, was issued. The next tradesman to appear is the instrument mechanic. A pilot's life depended on his instruments. The mechanic adjusts the zero of the Spitfire's rate of climb indicator. Although calibrated to 4,000 feet per minute, Spitfire 1's best climb was 2,500 feet per minute. The altimeter is set to QFE, the local barometric pressure, to read zero on that airfield on that day. The central standard blind flying panel, common to all RAF aircraft, is mounted on anti-vibration springs. The undercarriage warning horn is tested. This blows automatically if aircraft attempt to land with wheels up. The ethylene glycol coolant tank is checked, as is the pilot's oxygen supply. The total oxygen and rate of supply being constantly metered. Once oxygen became a standard fitting, it didn't take long for aircrew to discover that a few deep breaths of it were an instant cure for a hangover. The mechanic checks the time, adjusts the clock and winds it. The 5.8 gallon oil tank is topped up. Another airman cleans and checks the undercarriage well. When this film was shot just before the Battle of Britain, the reflector sight was still top secret. The instrument mechanic tests the brightness control of the internal lamp on which the sight depended. Three spare bulbs are carried in the cockpit. The Spitfire 1 had a control to enable the pilot to lower landing lights fitted under each wing. These powerful lights could also be moved up and down by the pilot. This refinement disappeared on later marks, since Spitfires proved unsuitable for night fighting. The fitter ensures that the fuel filler cap is secure. Next, the fuel gauges for the two internal tanks one contained 48, the other 37 imperial gallons. The airman then checks and cleans the engine radiator intake. In the cockpit, 
an airframe rigger operates the shutter which controls the radiator temperature. The Form 700 is signed. The daily inspection is complete. This Spitfire bears the code of number 609, West Riding Squadron. 609 is to be heavily engaged in the Battle of Britain, based at Middle Wallop in Warmwell. This unique film was shot in early June 1940 at number 6 maintenance unit, Rise Norton. The Spitfire is pushed past a parked Miles Master trainer and an early hurricane onto the large grass airfield. The light weight, 5,820 pounds of the Spitfire 1, is evident from the easy way the five-man handling crew turned the aircraft into wind for an engine run-up. The Spitfire required 2,400 rounds of 303-inch ammunition for its eight Browning guns. Belts are made up with either armor-piercing, incendiary or ball ammunition. The last 25 rounds were usually tracer to warn the pilot he was running out. Each gun had a 300 round belt which was loaded into a box magazine. As soon as the fight is landed after action, as soon as the propellers stopped turning, the ground crews were at work. While the aircraft refueled, beneath the wings, the armourers are removing the spent magazines from their stowage. Then they clean the barrels with the traditional 4 by 2 inch patch of flanolette leaving the guns clean, bright and slightly oiled. The oxygen bottles too are changed by the armourers. Fresh 300 round ammunition magazines are brought to the aircraft. Using a length of webbing, the belts are fed through the gun breeches. This simple device enabled the armourers to rearm a Spitfire in less than 10 minutes instead of the original 20, since they no longer had to remove the eight access panels on the upper surfaces of the wings. The guns are cocked and the access panels replaced using the patent fastening. As any ex-armourer or rigger...